Good morning, everyone. My name is Paul. I'm the Community Impact Director here at Mill City Church. I'm so thankful for the opportunity to be part of this sermon series uh, as we cover the prophets of the Old Testament. Uh, during 2021, we have been covering the entirety of the Old Testament, uh, going from genre to genre. Now, there are many genres in the Old Testament, and each of them are intended to be read differently. The Old Testament was written for an entirely different audience in another language, uh, which can make it difficult for us to understand the original context. Uh, but the Old Testament is crucial when it comes to understanding the biblical meta narrative, that is, God's mission to restore creation and humanity. Some of you may know that my mom's side of the family is Jewish, and I love connecting the Old Testament to how we can love our community in the name of Jesus. Many years ago, I used to manage restaurants. One of the first few restaurants I ever managed was this hip Jewish diner. This place was crazy busy, held all the nostalgia of my childhood, uh, and had some of the best matzo ball soup I'd ever tasted. It seemed like a dream come true, really. Uh, I can remember clearly thinking to myself, Paul, your grandfather would be so proud. Uh, so what seemed like a dream come true wasn't really all of that. It's just not how it t turned out to be. Um, it didn't take long for me to realize that I've got a bad feeling about this. Uh, now, at my previous job, I had an outstanding mentor. He taught me the ins and outs of restaurant management, but he also taught me hospitality, accountability, and adherence to the standards. I found joy in figuring out creative ways to take care of the guests. I relish the opportunity to take someone's less than perfect situation and turn it into an amazing experience. Um, things didn't quite work that same way at this new restaurant. At the new restaurant, it was very busy. Uh, because of this, we never took reservations and we were almost always on a wait. Uh, if someone was upset about the wait or anything like that, we were trained to fire the guest and kick them out of the restaurant. Uh, the owner would encourage us to uh, tell someone off if they didn't like our policies. In essence, they could shut up or get out. This caused me to change. I wanted to do my job uh, and do it well, but my new boss had expectations. Uh, I didn't w agree with what was being asked of me, but I did it anyway. And I started to get a sense of exhilaration when something like this would happen. Um, it was like I was breaking the rules, but I was being encouraged and rewarded for doing so. How many people have been in a similar situation? You've been taught by someone that you love and admire uh, that there's a right way to do things. Someone who is wise and loving and has your best interest at heart. Like your parents teaching you not to cross in the middle of the street. But that first time that you do it and you get away with it, you're so excited. That's kind of how I felt. I hit a turning point, however, after something happened to my boss. He got into a fist fight with a customer who didn't want to pay $2 over a valet. I'm going to say that again one more time. He got into a literal fist fight caught on our security cameras over someone not wanting to pay $2 to valet their car. I looked at him and I looked at myself and I realized something. I was not living with integrity. What I mean by integrity is when your actions mirror your beliefs. Those lessons that we have learned, the structures that shape our behavior and our faith, those are our beliefs. I'm sure I'm not the only one who has been in a situation where they were living out of alignment when your actions and your beliefs were not in line. I think most of you can point to a time at home, at work, at school, uh, where you were living without integrity at one point or another. Now, here's perhaps a tougher question. Are you living with integrity right now? Pastor Steph and Adobe have been talking about the warning signs in the books of the prophets. Now, the prophets were people who had been given messages from God to share with God's people. They were speaking to God's people during 1st and 2nd Samuels and 1st and 2nd Kings uh, when the Bible is documenting 
the events of the various kings of Israel and Judah. Uh, God had told his people, I am your leader, but the people wanted a human king to be like the surrounding nations. So God gave them what they wanted. God sent, uh, oh, sorry, almost every single one of these kings led the people further away from God's heart. So God sent prophets uh, to call out the kings and the people when they were in violation of God's covenant and when they were drifting further away from God's heart. So take a moment and think about those warning signs. Maybe you've gotten off course in your life and God is trying to bring you back onto the right track. Or maybe you're like Jonah, bringing a storm around uh, on everyone around you because you haven't been listening. So as we continue this month looking at the prophets, we're going to be moving from the warning signs to learning how to live. The prophets had a lot to say about how God invites us to live as those who represent God's heart to the world around us. Um, so if God has brought up warning signs in your life, the great news is that the prophets can also help us learn how to live. About 700 years before Jesus was born, there is a prophet named Micah. Micah comes from a small town southwest of Jerusalem, but is called by God to prophesy to Israel and Judah, the kingdoms. At this time, the Israelites had been split into two separate kingdoms, neither of which is doing a good job of representing God. So the prophet Micah focuses on the theme of living justly. And at its core, living justly is living with integrity. Micah does a fantastic job of clearly telling us what it is to live with integrity. In chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 8, Micah brings forth legal accusations from God against his people. Imagine a cosmic courtroom scene of sorts where God is both the prosecutor and the judge. The people of Israel are the defendants and creation itself is the witness. God is accusing Israel of having broken the covenant that God had made with them. Imagine the scene as I read. So you can follow me uh, in the NIV. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak king of Moab plotted and what Balaam son of Beor answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So let's break that down a bit. In verses 1 through 5, Micah is speaking with the voice of Yahweh. As I said, God is poetically calling forth the mountains and foundations of the earth, which have existed since he first created, to stand as witnesses in this court case. God then addresses his own saving acts and might. Uh, God rescued the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt, sent them strong leaders, and established a covenant with them. Instead of allowing Balak, the king of Moab, to curse the Israelites, he instead uh, used Balaam to bless them. And when the Israelites were enticed to sin against God and Shittim, God stayed faithful to his promise to them and led them across the Jordan into the promised land. God has to point out to the people the ways that God has been faithful to them. Their actions would suggest that they had forgotten. Then in verses 6 through 8, Micah is now speaking with his own voice to the people of Israel and Judah. 
in this section, he is responding to the offering of sacrifices uh, to appease and make peace with God. Are the burnt offerings of year-old calves enough? Are thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil a sufficient apology? Should the Israelites sacrifice their firstborn children like the surrounding nations were doing for their gods? The answer is clear and the answer is no. God has already shown you, Israel, what is good. Judah, you know what the Lord wants from you. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. To partake in God's good works. We are given these instructions in God's divine revelation in the Old Testament, and here we are called to account for not obeying. Uh, in Micah chapter 2, verses 1-2, through two, he says, Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light they carry it out, because it is in their power to do it. They covet fields and seize them, and houses and take them. They defraud people of their homes. They rob them of their inheritance. And then further in chapter 3, verses 9 through 12. Hear this, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, who despise justice and distort all that is right, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with wickedness. Her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortunes for money. Yet they look for the Lord's support and say, Is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble, and the temple hill a mound overgrown with thickets. This is an indictment of the leaders and false prophets of Israel and Judah. They despise justice. They distort all that is right. Like a child crossing in the middle of the street, they know what is right, but choose not to do it. They get away with it and think they can continue to do so. But ultimately, they are deceiving themselves. Remember, God gave the people kings as a concession because that is what they wanted. Yet almost every single one of them led the people further away from God's heart. The king was a representative of the community, and their deeds ushered in times of peace or times of ruin. Verse 12 is a stern warning of what will come because of these actions of the kings and their people. Spoiler alert, this warning was not in jest. Assyria comes into Israel, ruins it, and takes the people away. Later, the armies of Babylon come and conquer Jerusalem and lead its people into exile as well. Think about it this way. God's covenant with his people is the backbone of their faith. When they were stepping further away from God's instructions, they were out of alignment. The prophets are like God's chiropractors to his people. Their job is to help get the community back into alignment. Now, for those of you who haven't had back problems, uh, you might not know how intimidating it is to get your back adjusted. You're afraid that it's going to hurt. But the truth is, you are already in pain. Uh, with a sharp crack, your spine is shifted back into place. God realigns you so that you can be free of that pain and stand up right again. This warning, this accusation is a free consultation. And the prognosis for Israel and Judah, y'all are a mess. Now let's get you back into shape. So put yourself into the divine chiropractor's office. Where are you out of alignment? In what ways are your actions not mirroring your beliefs? Check this out. We're going to go back further in the Old Testament to a time before God has even given the people prophets. Join me in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 10, verses 16 through 21. This is shortly after God freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt and is first establishing his covenant with them. At this time, God clearly introduces to the Israelites what doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly looked like. Therefore, change your hearts and stop being stubborn. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. He is the great God, the mighty and awesome God, who shows no partiality and cannot be bribed. 
He ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. Uh, he, must, he shows love to the foreigners living among you and gives them food and clothing. So you too must show love to foreigners, for you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. You must fear the Lord your God and worship him and cling to him. Your oaths must be in his name alone. He alone is your God, the only one who is worthy of your praise, the one who has done these mighty miracles that you have seen with your own eyes. Being impartial, loving justice, loving our neighbors and foreigners and widows and orphans, showing love to and demanding justice for those who are on the margins of society and are being oppressed. These are some of the first instructions that God gives to his people. Yet when we get to Micah and the rest of the prophets, the Israelites have already failed to follow God's instructions over and over again. These commands are fundamental to our beliefs, and I think I would be hard-pressed to find someone who is a Christian that would disagree with any of these things. But the real question is, are we acting out these beliefs in our everyday lives? Or are we paying lip service to these standards of our faith? I'll bring it back to my restaurant example. I was taught the right way of doing things. I was filled with life and joy and wonder uh, when I was living in integrity and taking care of my responsibilities. And I was bringing life-giving moments in whatever simple and brief way that a dining experience can to the people who came into my establishment. Then I was tempted to do what I didn't believe in. I had forsaken my mentor and his guidance to appease someone that I didn't agree with. In essence, I gave my consent for injustice and took part in it because it was easy. And that is what the Israelites are doing. Uh, they were giving up on what was right by following the practices of those around them. Their leaders were steering them wrong and many followed because it was easy. Why do we cross in the middle of the street when we know we should be walking in the crosswalk? Isn't it safer to wait for the light to change? Because it's easy, because we don't wanna wait, because we haven't been hit by a car yet. We, don't, we know what we're supposed to do, yet we don't do it. God has shown you what is good. God has told you what he requires of you, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The prophets are delivering some exceptionally raw and hard to swallow information. They warn God's people of those, and those warnings come to pass. But in this story, God provides the solution rather than the problem. That solution is Jesus. We see through the biblical narrative that we will not live with integrity at all times. God saw that humans were unable of holding up our part of the covenant and therefore sent Jesus to hold our end up for us. Our efforts alone could not right the wrongs, and they will not do so. Through Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection, our sins have already been washed away. The bill for the cosmic chiropractor has already been paid. The difference that Jesus makes is that we can step into his office and let the power of the Holy Spirit realign us. We've been talking about our housing and homelessness initiative the last few weeks and have issued the community a challenge. By definition, a challenge is not easy, but God presents us with challenges to strengthen us. Therefore, I invite you to this challenge as well. When it is easier to ignore justice, speak up. When it's easier to blame others, forgive them. When it's easier to focus inward, take Jesus' outstretched hand and walk with him. With Jesus' help, we can do each of these things here and now in our community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you have shown us how to be righteous, how to live with integrity in our faith. You have provided for us the greatest mentor who exemplifies the goodness of your ways. You have blessed us with the spirit of discernment giving us wisdom and cause to act. When we are unable to stand up straight, you lift us up before you. I pray that you help each and every one of us grow in acts of justice 